Communist Russia, the government shaped by and inherited from Joseph Stalin, has been the greatest geopolitical rival of the United States for multiple generations. Those who grew up after the Berlin Wall fell so soon have forgotten this. They may only learn it again to its full effect by studying history, and even then, it won't be the same as having lived through the experience. 20th century communism, in the grand utopian theory of those who defend it, can be summed up by the phrase, from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. It is the attempt to eliminate the profit-driven economy that has guided humanity for ages, the one which human societies default to for lack of a better alternative, and replace it with one which distributes wealth and possessions equally across all people. It is the pipe dream that starvation, homelessness, and injustice can be eliminated, and the attempt to lay out a system which accomplishes that. The places that tried to implement this all have variations in their theory and practice, but the basic principle is economic equality. So how does that work on a practical level? If you don't have much time, I'll recommend reading Animal Farm by George Orwell. If you have time for an average-length novel, I'll recommend reading 1984, also by Orwell. If you've already read these in high school, I encourage you to revisit visit them, as often the message of a book is better grasped in adulthood when read voluntarily, rather than for a class in your teenage years. If you have several months or possibly a year to dedicate to a single book, and I promise you this book is worth the slog, I recommend Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Orwell is an excellent fiction writer, and those two books I referenced by him are widely recognized as the key works for illustrating what it feels like to live in a society where speech is policed and failing economic ideas are defended with censorship and force, criticism disallowed by penalty of torture and death. It is, after all, hard to find a large-scale example of communism that has not devolved into a dictatorship wielding the strong arm of the state against its own population, while using the feel-good talking points of the ideology to enforce an illusion of peace and prosperity. Orwell knows what he's talking about, too, having affiliated himself with an anarchist leftist militia during the Spanish Civil War, and having had his share of conflict with the authoritarian communists who were influenced directly by Russian Soviets. Solzhenitsyn, on the other hand, wrote non-fiction. He was a Russian officer in World War II before being arrested and serving many years as a political prisoner in Stalin's gulags. He writes about every Every aspect of his experience material, political, historical, social, and spiritual. I cannot recommend that book enough. It is something I believe absolutely everyone should read, and I find it a pity that it's long enough to discourage many readers. Communists will tell you that everyone in society can prosper if only the wealth of the rich was distributed equally among the lower classes. They tell us that working, chasing the wage motive, is dehumanizing and drains the enthusiasm from those doing the work, that it would be better if the production was kept directly by those who produced it, with part of the production being given to those who are unable to support themselves. The idea that a communist system is more productive overall is a lie. If one is guaranteed the same income regardless of their productivity, or indeed regardless of whether they work at all, then there is simply no incentive to improve their own work output. Solzhenitsyn described how people would work as slowly and leisurely as they could get away with, because everyone knew that any promise of an end to the production quota was pure fantasy. They just weren't allowed to say it out loud. Capitalism is not perfect, but it's the best we have. It gives us oversaturation in advertising, lack of reward for artists, and a lack of solutions for homelessness and poverty. But it seldom produces situations where an average, gainfully employed individual is unable to afford food or entertainment. Large-scale communal societies, on the other hand, are often infamous for their famines. Communist ideologies, or socialist, or whatever label they choose to give themselves, all too often lead to dictatorship, speech policing, and imprisonment of innocents for supposed crimes that really just amount to saying or thinking the wrong thing. In Cuba, the Castro regime is infamous. I've listed entire books about the crimes of Stalin and those who came after him in Russia. In North Korea, neighborhoods are assigned agents who regularly check in on their neighbors and ensure ideological alignment and completion of state-assigned community service. In Cambodia, Pol Pot killed over a third of the nation's entire population. In China, entire parts of their history are hidden from their general population, and companies like Google and Wikipedia have entire parallel websites that are displayed within China in order to hide the truth. Even Jack Ma, one of the nation's richest men, had a weeks-long disappearance following a statement critiquing the CCP, following which he reappeared and recounted what he said. In one country after another, 
Communism leads to people being forced to live a lie, forced to conceal their true thoughts in order to remain safe in their homes. I am absolutely incapable of concealing my own honest thoughts for any great length of time. If the insistence on using correct wording and avoiding certain topics sounds familiar, you may recognize it from the modern social justice left wing in the United States. Illegal alien is offensive for some reason, but undocumented migrant is the preferred term. Queer, which decades ago was a slur, has now been reclaimed, and homosexual the scientific term for it, is beginning to cause discomfort. Colored people is offensive because it was used as a neutral descriptive term decades ago, but people of color is how they pridefully label themselves now. American Indians must be referred to as indigenous Americans. The list goes on. They assign terms which one must use or else face social or even professional consequences. Furthermore, certain opinions, if the left had the capability, would be one-way tickets to prison if spoken out loud. Make no mistake, the social justice left does not think those on the right side of politics are entitled to human rights. I know, because I went to school with these people. If they had enough political leverage, they would send everyone Clinton described as a basket of deplorables to torture and death camps without any hesitation and without losing a wink of sleep. They are completely convinced that doing so would be a moral good. It is an act of infinite mercy from God that the American iteration of the Marxist ideology is so incompetent. And yes, the American social justice movement is a variant of communist ideology. They simply replace the class groups of the proletariat and bourgeoisie with other social groups such as race, sexual orientation, religion, etc. There is a caveat to the rule of thumb that communism should not be attempted. There are certain criteria under which it can work, and I'd be dishonest if I were to ignore them. Many Amish communities have a communal economic system where income is given to the church, and the church pays for land, medicine, etc., while food and clothing are produced within the family unit. Hunter-gatherer cultures, the few that are left in the modern world, share everything they have with one another and don't often dwell on the concept of individual ownership of objects at all. Are you ready for another example that you might not expect? Video games. There are games I've played myself where a clan or alliance functions best if they're able to organize, plan, and schedule which members are to get which upgrades when. And they share resources freely in order to get that done. Those organized and regimented alliances in those games are almost always more competitive than the groups that amount to loose collections of individuals. Why is this? My criteria is this. The economic system of communism only works in systems which are small enough that every Everyone knows each other's name. If a peasant farmer in 1930s Russia knows that the majority of their harvest will get redistributed to someone halfway across the country who they've never met, then there's not much of an incentive to put forth effort. If a person you know well and regularly rely upon for help, on the other hand, is facing hardship, it's much easier to drop what you're doing and give from your own surplus. The feeling of social obligation is the element that is needed. On a national level, no communist system can ever work. On any scale large enough that ostracism is not an effective punishment, a communist system can never work.